Hey, Monica, did you know it's now even easier to listen to Round the Hay Bale podcast? What? Really? How easy? That's right. All you have to do is say, Alexa, play Round the Hay Bale podcast. Playing Round the Hay Bale podcast on Apple Music. Oh, we really fancy now. Tune in to Round the Hay Bale every Monday at 9 a.m. Central. Round the Hay Bale Unscripted is brought to you by... With gardening season at an end, Kelzyme certified organic products are still what your soil needs. From overwintering fruit trees to preparing your soil for spring, Kelzyme calcium-based fertilizer gives the essential minerals they need to thrive. Applying Kelzyme to agricultural soils and water has been proven to increase plant and crop yields while making vegetables and grains healthier and more nutritious. In addition, Kelzyme can help restore the nutrient balance in animals when they are fed plants grown using Kelzyme in both soil and water. To check out all of Kelzyme's organic products, visit Kelzyme.com and use the promo code HAYBALE for 10% off your purchase. Grab a cup of joe and gather round the hay bale with your hosts, Alicia from Country Mama Musings, Anne from Andale Homestead, Casey from Ormsby Farms, and Monica from Bland's Promised Land Ranch. Now, here they are, unscripted. Hey, y'all. Hey! Hey, everybody. Welcome back to yet another episode of Round the Hay Bale Season 4 Unscripted. I am Alicia from Country Mama Musings. And I'm Anne from Andale Homestead. Hello, everyone. It's Casey from Ormsby Farms. And I'm Monica from Bland's Promised Land Ranch. Well, you know, friends, this time of year, it's time for us to wrap up the year for our homesteading and prepare for our gardens for next season. We're all kind of in that mode of thinking about how are we going to wrap things up this year and get things ready for next year. Well, you know, we have a friend with us today. His name is Rich. He's a homesteader. He's a U. Tuber, and he is from Old Swedes Farm. He's joining us here on the panel today because he has a fantastic garden set up, and we thought it only appropriate to bring him here at the end of the year and share with us what he's doing to wrap up his garden for the end of the year and what he's going to be doing for preparing for the spring months ahead with his beautiful, beautiful garden. Rich, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So, Now, if anybody's not familiar, again, I'm going to say it's Old Swedes Farm. You need to go check him out on YouTube. We'll make sure that his his URL is in the description because he has a beautiful, beautiful garden set up. I personally, out of of our panel here, I had the opportunity to actually visit Rich up on his homestead. And I've walked the garden. And I got to tell you, I left feeling a little jelly, even though Rich and I have similar setups. He and I both use the big watering troughs, the livestock troughs for our raised gardens. And we also use the cattle panels for the arches. But my tiny, teeny little garden just pales in comparison to the beautiful garden that I saw last year when hubby and I went up and we visited uh, Rich and his wife up at their homestead. So Rich, why don't you tell us a little bit about what inspired you first off? What inspired you to put this garden together and come up with these unique ways to put your garden together? You know, uh, I've been a gardener. My dad was a master gardener. He he really got me inspired in gardening, especially vegetable gardening. And I love to eat. So that's a, a good thing to have. Um, when we moved out to the farm, we wanted to have a big garden. And so we started staking off the garden and it, it comes in at about point, almost 0.3 acres is our garden. It's, it's a pretty good sized garden. What inspired us to do some of the things we did is my dad always said, if you're going to do something, do it right. Uh, and I fall into that. I want to do it one time. So those uh, big metal troughs, those are going to probably outlast me. Um, the, the big trellises made of, uh, cattle panels. Those will outlast me. I, I'm putting in things that are going to be permanent um, for the garden. And then also I've got a lot of garden fabric down in areas where I can plant. And I did that because I hate weeding. There is nothing worse. The two things I hate doing are weeding and watering. 
I'd rather be uh, harvesting and eating. There you um, go. But I'm trying to build a garden that will, I'm not trying to do anything on the cheap. Uh, I mean, there's some expense in all that. I've saved up for it. But I want to do it right one time, not build something. And then three years from now, it deteriorates. And I got to do it again. And then again, I that's the whole thing behind the garden. Um, and then it's just been a matter of layout. You know, how do we lay it out so that it's functional? Um, I can group certain plants together. Um, I can get in and water easier. Um, or so I thought, you know, there's always uh, things. And something, you know, we'll talk about tonight probably is, what are, what are the improvements? You know, every year there's something we change or we don't like for some reason, but a lot of it's functionality and wanting to do things one time. There, there always is growth and trial and error when you put your garden together and, and you were saying how you want to do it one time, you want to do it right. I fall into the category of, oh, I think this is really nice. I like the way it looks. I put it together and then I realize I've put two of my troughs too close together and I can't even get in there. <laughs> to get some of the bounty, I actually, and some of my co-hosts may remember this, I actually had to crawl into one of my archways one time to try to get green beans. And one of the tendrils to the green beans yes, wrapped around my yes, neck. Yes, we remember, friend. We do remember. Rich, I walked out and didn't realize this tendril. And you know how they got those little spikies yep. on them? It actually, like, tried to decapitate me. I It actually cut my neck. I had a, I had a, 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 like a scabby scratch on my neck. Gardens for, are know, capable of, of fighting back sometimes. They did. And I realized I just have everything too close together. If I would have had it a little bit more space, I would have been able to get in there. But I had a really good good harvest la- that year, but it tried to kill me. So I know Was that you're the year Papa about. Jim had to go to the police station for a talk <laughs> when you had that scar on oh, your yeah. neck. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, 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 had, uh, I had a lot of interrogations. Are you safe? Yeah, oh, my husband's yeah. fine. It's the garden that tried to kill me. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she, yeah, yeah. And then the guys in the white coats show up. <laughs> I end up at, at 5E over at the hospital. So, um, but I understand what you're saying. You want to set it up. You want to do it right. I'm in the conundrum right now where I want to move some of my troughs. And they're so heavy because we did hugel culture. They're not going anywhere. I'm just going to have to learn to deal with it. Now, did you do hugel culture with, with your raised troughs? I did not. Nope. Uh, we we do a layering. I've got a video out there, but it's uh, probably about four inches of, we've got so much rock that we found in the garden as we're putting it together, so much rock that is in the woods. We put about four inches of small rock down, then garden fabric over it. There's our barrier to keep the dirt from washing out. There are holes in the bottom of the trough so it doesn't fill up with water. And on top of the rock and the fabric, then we put all the soil and uh, chicken manure and all that. There's no lack of soil amendments with our chickens. So I, I don't throw in the logs and all that. I, and I, I've never seen that in action. So I don't know if that works. So it I, does work. I, I did okay. mine with Google culture and uh, the, the rest of the panel can attest my tomatoes last year were just insane between the Google culture the cattle panel trellises and then Kelzyme, which is the additive that, that sponsors our program. It is such a great additive for your plants. I just had amazing, amazing Amish paste tomatoes, but those beds are Google culture and it has okay. worked really, really well for us. Casey? I was just going to say, as you know, Rich is going through all the stuff that he put in his garden, you know, doing it right the first time and make sure you get it done the first time and not having to do it every couple of years. Me and Anne have actually talked about this. When I saw Rich's garden for the first time and saw that he was a ground coverer, I don't know what you would call it, rather than like um, pro coverer -er -er, um, I was like, see, that's why I knew I loved Rich. Because we are so pro ground cover because I despise weeding. When you have now, I will say my garden is not as big as Rich. When he was saying 0. 0.3 of the acres, I was like, oop, and I'm complaining about mine being too large. Um, the, the less weeding and watering that I have to do in my garden, the better. Um, and... I saw that he was a ground coverer, and I, I was so proud of you, Rich. Now, what ground cover do you use for our listeners? Where did you get it? Um, how did you decide on this specific ground cover? 
you know, I should have I should have looked this up. Some actually, we had someone that came out to the garden to grab some peppers tonight, and they asked the same thing. Um, I I I can't even think. It's sun something. I'm uh, sounds like a free promotion here, but uh, I have a video out on our channel about our ground cover. I can't think of the name. It's sun something. I think it's like SBT thirty three hundred or something. It how I chose it. I went to the store and what I noticed at the big box stores was there is ground cover you put down and it does not, it's not UV resistant. And I'm like, why would you ever put ground cover down for a garden that's not UV resistant? So I started really doing some research and I got one roll of this. It's three feet wide. I think it's 300 feet long. And I did a part of our garden with it and it withstood, it held up all summer incredible. And so I got more and just kept going from there. Um, I'm sorry if I, uh, I, I don't know the name of it, but I wanted something that is going to hold up for five, 10 years. Um, and, and that's what and, I use the props for. Well, as well. listeners, I, we'll put it in the, we'll put it in the show notes. We'll talk to um, Rich off the recording and find the exact one that he got. And we'll put it in our show notes yeah. um, because that is true. So finding something that's UV resistant is important. And who this would is, buy something that wasn't? Well, <laughs> probably it, me. And, and some my, people do. Yeah. I, we bought what was handy and I don't know, is it UV resistant? All I can tell you is right now it is a shredded mess it's all going to have to come up. My chickens go out there because I didn't put in a garden this year. I was like, oh, let them just, you know, turn everything over and have fun. They're getting tangled in it all the time. It's a disaster. It's a terrible, terrible cover. So, I mean, it, it well, pays to think ahead and put that extra investment into a ground cover that's not going to fall apart on you like mine did. There it is. The De DeWalt SBLT 3300. Sun oh, okay. Sunbelt ground cover weed barrier. Uh, thanks, Monica. Looked that up. Thank you. I was um, about to say, Mo Monica is our um, uh, 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 detective Nancy of the group. Uh, <laughs> she will find it if anybody can find it. But we will still put it in our show notes, yeah. um, and I'll see if I can't find a link um, to put down so you can go because well, it truly is important to get good ground it's cover, on but Amazon. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to put, put it over to Monica, even though she is anti ground cover, but I will pitch it over to Monica now. So I am anti ground cover typically only because, um, I want to try the, I want to try a new method. I really want to try the no till, but if you go to, we'll put this information in there, but if you go to Rich's, not only his actual never weed your garden again, garden fabric installed, right? Video. He did it in July of this year. You'll be able to see all three of the items that he uses for the video the ground cover. He even has the garden staples and the butane torch that he used. And so we'll make sure we add that into our links and in our information. But if you decide, you know, you can't see our links or you don't see our links somewhere, then make sure you go over to his video and look him up and just type in, you know, Old Tweets Farm. And you'll see if you go back to the summertime, he did a video on it and you'll know it's that video. So that's, it's easy to find, Rich. Very easy to find. So Remind me when, when we talk about getting ready for next year and what do you do in the winter? Um, I'll, I'll talk about, remind me about garden fabric, because there's some things to prep for putting garden fabric down. You don't just lay it down. There's some Well, I'm finished there. talking. So if you want to start oh. talking about that kind of stuff, you're more than oh. welcome, because I'm good, because I don't use ground cover. So when it comes to using, when, if you have ground cover, I, you know, that's a great idea. What, what do you do in the winter? How do you prepare once your spring, summer season is over? What do you do with the ground cover? Do you leave it? Yep. Yep. Uh, well, let me step back. And what did okay. I do the first the first season? You know, I've seen people put ground cover down and it looks like a mini golf course out there. It's it, it's just little rolling hills all over the place and they're tripping on things. And what what you want to do, I rototilled the first first year we had the garden and then to get ready for the next season, tilled it again and leveled it out and then let it just sit um, all winter. Just let it sit, let it snow on it, rain on it, and it compacts things down a little bit and it levels it out. It was a nice level, like 30 by 50 foot area that we had, our first area. Once it's leveled out in the spring, then it you know kind of hardens up, then you can put the fabric down. Because it is, if you notice, 
it's flat. My garden in that area where I've got the fabric, it is flat. But that's because we put in the prep work the, the fall before and let it sit all winter. Then once you got it all stapled down, then you can use that butane torch to put the holes in. And we do it three, the rows three feet apart and 18 inch plant separation. So there's kind of a method to the madness. Um, what do I do now each winter? I'm pulling out the plants right now and I will dig down in the hole with the soil that I just used. And I'm going to put in new soil with some chicken manure and let it sit all winter and kind of break down. Um, so it spends that time, so the chi especially with chicken manure that's so hot, I let it break down over the winter. And then in the spring, all I got to do is just put my, my little potted plant that I've been growing since March, put it in the hole, put a little bit uh, more manure on top and go grow. Okay. And it's all ready to go. Um, now, Rich, I just, just in case our listeners don't know, because some of them are new homesteaders and for those who have just started homesteading, who have started their gardens, and maybe they have chickens for the first year, what do you mean when you say that your chicken manure is hot? Explain oh, that uh, to them, because they may not know. There, there's certain manure that uh, you can put in with your plants immediately, and it's so healthy and ready to grow. Rabbit manure, some composted uh, cow manure, some of that. Chicken manure is hot. It is it's got a lot of nitrogen, a lot of active ingredients that will burn your roots. If it's up against the plant, it will, it'll kill your plant. It is just so hot. It is, uh, there's so much going on in that manure. It needs time to break down. So I usually throw it in a big pile all winter. Then I work it in with soil. And then the following year, I'll use that chicken manure. So uh, Casey, you had something that... I was just going to say that it's so funny that you said put it in a pile because it's so funny. Every time I put a video out on my new chickens or my garden, Rich is one of the first two comments on there. And he's like, Casey, put it in a pile. Casey, just put it in a pile. Casey, put it in a pile. And that's truly because as the chicken manure, it is gold, y'all. It is gold. Listeners, don't think that we're saying don't use it for your garden, but you shouldn't take it like rabbit manure and put it straight on your plants. Or I also plant tomato plants with rabbit manure. I do a handful of rabbit manure and then a plant. You can't do that with chicken manure. Let it sit over the winter since we're talking about what, uh, yeah, just dig it out with your hands and drop it. Get it all in your nails. That's right, Monica and Alicia. Um, I don't know where you're getting that. You're, you're, you're using... You're using, I'm using uh, freeze dried rabbit yeah, manure. You literally could take a handful because I'm going to tell you what, my stuff is fresh over here. We ain't freeze dry and no rabbit poop over here. Okay. And well, we are not picking harvest up. Right, if you want to get Monica a freeze dryer, she would love to freeze dry her rabbit poop. No, I ain't freeze dry no poop in my freeze dryer. <laughs> I don't have rabbits, but I'd, I'd be willing to try it if they would just send me a freeze dryer. <laughs> One tray, only freeze dried poop right there. I'll, yeah. I'll freeze dry any poop you want if you send me a freeze dryer, but only in that one tray. But no, you're pulling it out because you've got freeze dried already. Mm -hmm. Like, but I mean, I mean, you can still use it fresh, but you, you're not using handfuls. Just so you know. Well, just for our listeners, that it it is true that if you're listening to Rich right now, put the chicken manure in a separate pile or a compost pile. Let it sit over the winter because that's what we're talking about on this episode. Is how do you prep? for the next season. This is the best way. Go ahead when you're cleaning out your chicken coop. And I'm going to go to everybody in the panel because all of us have chickens now, including me and Ann Dale. We may be the yes. newer chicken owners, but we are chicken owners now. We are. Uh, wh when does everybody clean out, and this is kind of calling folks out, when do you clean out your chicken coop? How many times a month do you do it? I'm going to start with Monica. A month? Oh, well, no. Wait. Monica Just start is... with me. Monica I'm with Anne. Anne. I was a little busy there for a second. Um, now, I mean, I just do it when it's needed because we don't have very many chickens. So it's not a weekly thing. And I've been told two schools of thought. One, you just keep putting bedding on them and throw some lime in there. <laughs> And some DE you know, for the smell, die tenacious earth, and keep going. Now we've had our we've had our chickens, the two girls. We only had two from 
April. And then we just put the six little girls in there a couple of months ago. So we have eight chickens. It's not like we've got, you know, a hundred that are running around. But I probably, since they've been in there, cleaned it out three or four times, maybe. Only because we live in a neighborhood and I can't have the smell, you know. Right. Right, you can't be smelling like a chicken factory. You can't be smelling like a chicken factory. But it's still, even at that, there have been many times that I've just thrown more bedding on top and more lime and stuff like that. So, okay, thank you. What about what about Alicia? Alicia, how many times do you kind of clean out the chicken coop? Well, I'm going to be honest with you guys, because when I first got my chickens, I really decided to do the deep litter method. So what I did was when we first built our chicken coop, I put their bedding down. They poop. I put more bedding down. We use the pine shavings. And, uh, but, you know, my chicken coop has never been a traditional just regular chicken coop because we've had the pigs have lived with the chickens for a while there. We had the goats live with the chickens. So everybody's in there. But um, when I reclaimed the chicken coop and decided to... Uh, reclaim that area and make my summer kitchen. Yes, my summer kitchen used to be a coop and a pigsty. That's when I took all of the, oh, let me think, four or five years of built up manure and rototill it. And then I scooped it right out the side of the garage where their coop was. And I put it in all those raised beds that we were talking about earlier that I did hookah culture. So um, you're saying you, you did like a the kitty litter you for five years. It was just kind of like spread, put more wood chips. I didn't even spread. I oh, you they, just they would do their thing. They'd live in that chicken coop, and then I'd run down to the store and I'd get the pine shavings. And I don't even spread out the pine shavings. I just put I open the bag and I dump it in a big pile because chickens love to spread piles. They do all the work for you, so it would spread around. And you know the reason I do that is because in the wintertime it generates heat. And where Rich and I live, I mean, we get wind chills that are 50 below zero, and we need that oh. heated, that added heat. I do not use heat lamps in my chicken coop at all. It's too much of a danger. It's too much of a risk. But because that deep litter method is layer upon layer upon layer of something that's composting, it generates heat during the wintertime and keeps them warm. Having said that, now that I have them moved to a different part of their coop, and we have rebuilt this coop, I've not cleaned it once. They scatter things around where it needs to be. I know that if I need something from my garden, I can just go in a corner and I can dig something up and I'm good because it's so deep, especially like where the pig sleeps. I know I don't have to worry about him so much as the chickens. So in all honesty, to answer your question, in nine years, I've really truly only cleaned my coop once <laughs> because of okay. deep litter method. Well, I have a question before we get further along, and I, I forget. Wintertime is coming. Now, our winters are mild here in northeastern North Carolina. We occasionally get to zero, maybe a day. Most of the time, we're just under freezing at most. If it's in the 20s here, we are breaking out all the fur jackets and, you know, carrying on like we need to break out the snowshoes or something. That's but, not winter. That's not weather. We have wood stoves going and weather. everything. No, That's that I, south stuff. Yeah, it was 62 in the house tonight, and I told Worth we had to have the heater on because I'm freezing. <laughs> but my question, being a new chicken mama, I've never been through a winter with chickens before. You don't need a heater. Okay, <laughs> because I was sent one. No, but you I don't need a heater for them. Miss Ann? In the winter time, yeah, don't feel bad. Not a heat light. It's a, it's like one of those, you know, square. You don't need a like a real, that's for your little babies. Heater. You only need a right. little heat brooder, like a brooder tray, like a, a heat brooder thing. Use that for your babies when you have babies, babies or just put babies. your little tootsies under and warm your feet at night. Don't okay. use a free, don't use No, I'll your, say this because me and Ann Dale are the newbie ones. And yeah. Ann Dale, I felt the same way. Me, I don't know when to clean the coop. I don't know. Me what and Mama about Guess me. were all worried because our temperatures were getting to 42 the past couple of nights. And yeah. one of my homesteading girlfriends was like, okay, Casey, I want you to one stop, take a breather, <laughs> and 
And remember that that is why they tell you don't put sweaters on your chickens. Chickens regulate their no. own heat and that kind of stuff from their feathers. And when you look at chickens, like most of them, if you look up the variety of the chicken, um, it will tell you the coldest temperature that they do and the hottest temperature. Most of the time, chickens are negative 20. They can get to negative 20, and they're usually pretty rock solid. Now, the hottest temperature is like Monica's temperature, which is like 110. And they're like, yeah, homie, if you could turn on a fan, that'd be great. So I'm going to pass it on to the cold, cold people now. But well, that's just what I've say, learned. Uh. Rich, you've got many more chickens than I do. He's got a great setup up at his farm. Um, explain to our listeners and to our new little chicken mamas, you know, why they don't need a source of heat and, and how a chicken's body works so that they don't need a heater in their coop. Right. And, when, and do you clean out the coop here oh, in wintertime? Uh, oh, we yeah. use... We use deep litter. We've got a barn. You know, we had a coop. We started in a coop that we built, and the coop was literally eight feet by eight feet, uh, four feet tall. The coop itself, um, and then they had a run that was fourteen by eighteen, and then we let them free range too. But for the winter, they were pretty confined. Then we moved them into our barn, and it's about a thirty foot by thirty foot area. Now I can't put pine shavings down on that. Uh, that's just too much. But we use straw. We go deep litter. So in the winter, um, we will, the girls are, are pooping. They're throwing down that nitrogen. We put down the straw and, and we do during the winter about a, a bale of straw per week. And we'll do like Alicia says, we'll break it into four or five inch chunks and just lay it on the ground. Uh, and the girls, the hens will spread it everywhere in the barn. So I've been we get breaking my neck to break that bedding stuff up. No, the that's the, that's part of let the chickens work for you. Um, they're throwing the nitrogen down, put the straw down, and that's the the uh, carbon, and those two together will will mix together and start composting. And then the next week, you know, they're still pooping. You throw down some more straw, and over time, you've got this layer. I literally will clean out the barn in. March or April, whenever spring arrives up here. And by the way, for everybody listening, I'm in Minnesota, uh, kind of central Minnesota. We do Minnesota. get cold, but during the winter, if you I've, couldn't tell by the accent, yeah, we we don't have an accent. Um, y'all y'all got an accent, you know? Yeah, we do. Um, I do. <laughs> in the middle of winter, I've got one of our videos. It was 15 below outside, and I came in with into the barn with my little heat gun. And that deep litter had the floor at 28 degrees. So, okay. um, and so the chickens are on there, but we, we have breeds that, you know, I've got uh, Isa Browns, uh, Bard Plymouth Rock. If you look at those chickens, they've got a good set of feathers and they've got a down jacket underneath. They are bred for cold weather. They are bred, you know, and I've got them on a, a floor that's at 28 degrees with that deep yeah. litter. Um, they do not need a heater. And I would say even when they were outside, they don't need a heater. If I get them so dependent on that heater and all of a sudden our, we get a big winter storm and our power goes out, they're dead. Those chickens okay. are gonna are not going to survive. I need them to be hardy chickens, which they are, and then they can work and provide you know some of that. When it's 30 below outside, it's 30 below in the barn. The only thing I will do to help them is I will give some supplemental treats, um, some mealworms. I'll bring in some corn. When corn gets inside a chicken, it helps provide a little bit of internal heat. It actually uh, fires the engine a little more. Uh, okay. The, the biggest threat for chickens is the heat, not the cold. When it gets up near 100 degrees here in Minnesota in the summer, that's the time I need to really be watching my girls, watching the water, giving them frozen treats. No corn in the summer, none of that kind of stuff, because that'll just continue to fire their furnace. Um, the heat okay. is more of a, you need to watch your girls down where you live in the summer and really keep tabs on it. If it's getting to 30 degrees, I mean, my girls will be loving life. So okay. you're, you'll Thank be fine. You. Thank you for that information, yeah. because I, I don't know. Well, my question, because now... Both me and Ann Dale are kind of taking notes as we're listening. Um, we is are. with the corn, 
do you give them dried corn or is that like corn straight off the cob or what's the best way to give it to them over the winter? What we do, you know, right now the, the farmers are uh, harvesting their, their corn, it's seed corn. And so we just go and find someone that's harvesting and Hey, can you, can we grab some corn or Hey, do you mind if I walk the edge of your field? Cause when they turn the combine around, they miss a couple of rows and all that corn's laying on the ground. So we grab, you know, half of the corn that's on the ground and some of it uh, I, we leave for the pheasants and, and wild turkeys or just go to the store and grab a bag, a 50 pound bag of uh, cracked corn or whole cor- whole kernel corn is like 12 bucks. Yeah. Um, we get and I don't give them tons of it. Their, their layer feed is their main food, but to give a small bowl for, you know, 60 chickens, what I do is, I put it in a bowl and at night I sprinkle it all around the barn. Well, that gives them something to do. They love to scratch. While they're scratching, they're taking their droppings and the straw and mixing it up again, getting that composting going. Um, They're looking for food. They're not pecking on each other. So they're doing a little bit of the work to get that compost from my garden ready for the spring. Because all that stuff, when I when April comes and I put it in wheelbarrow loads and bring it out to that big pile, Casey, it's it's already turned over and then it's got to wait, you know, a season and it's ready to go. Okay. There's your pumpkin stuff. You're going to have incredible pumpkins next year, Casey, because you're going to have a full year's worth of chicken droppings out there. Seriously. <laughs> and for those that are listening, uh, pumpkins are my trigger point. Cucumbers was Alicia's trigger point um, last season. Pumpkins are mine. But now I know is you just shovel the you know what into a pile um, and let it sit for a year. That is that is truly really good information, especially for new chicken owners. To but, know. I mean, a year? Get a bale of straw, Casey, here and there. Uh, I don't think you've got as many chickens as we've got, but make sure you've got some straw down. Make some piles. Let them work that together and let it start composting over the winter, too. Usually bales of straw, at least here, are like five bucks a bale. So yeah, um, it's cheap, it's cheap. So at the end of pumpkin farm season, no offense, Casey, um, but at the end of these pumpkin seasons, go to these big pumpkin farms that are doing all the different stuff. And usually they have straw bales. And so each season, usually the first week of November, um, right around Eric's birthday, we take that first weekend of November and we go and we basically clean up a local pumpkin farm. We get all the pumpkins from there. We usually get at least um, three, anywhere between three and six of those boxes filled with pumpkins that they just can't sell throughout the season um i'm happy with just one or two bins but most of the years we get three to six bins i mean we load them up into our livestock trailer and there have been times most seasons we leave pumpkins behind because we just don't have any more room but they also have straw bales that we just take the rest of them and um, there's been a few seasons when they were wet, so we would bring them home and kind of lay them out so they could kind of dry. But we use those straw bales to line our pig pens. Once they're dry, we use them for the pig pens. We use them for the chicken coops. We use those straw bales for everything because if I even went to touch the hay that Eric buys for the cattle, he would probably mm-hmm. b- blow a fuse. His head would literally explode because the hay is very precious. It's a precious commodity here. It costs No, quite- not Eric Bland. Uh, I but, don't believe yeah. it. But the straw bales are free a lot of times. So find your local churches that are finished with their harvest festivals or whatever and be like, hey, I can help you take those straw bales off your hands. A lot of people want to partner with local farms. Go and get what they have left over for your chickens and whatever animals you have. So, and we, yeah, Monica makes two really good points. One, we use straw, not hay. Mm -hmm. Hay is more expensive. Hay is usually a feed where straw, for us, straw is what we need. Um, And I think most chicken owners could go with straw versus hay. They're not feeding hay to their chickens. Um, The other thing is, I, and I don't know if this is proven or not, but I've heard that pumpkins can be, for chickens, a dewormer. So I grow a lot of pumpkins. I Since I'm in Minnesota, it's going to get cold here pretty quick. I put the, the leftover pumpkins or I'll visit a few pumpkin patches and see if I can get extra pumpkins. And I put them in my garage and let them freeze. If you've got freezer space, put a few pumpkins in there. And once a week, I bring out a big pumpkin and put it in the barn another uh, boredom buster for my chickens 
let them peck at that. They're eating the seeds. It keeps them busy. They're not pecking on each other. If it's a dewormer, you know what? They're they're eating that pumpkin. I've never had worms uh, with my chickens, so I don't know if the pumpkin chickens. thing is true. But Monica, great point. Uh, get out there. You know, I want to touch on one more thing because we're talking about it, even though it's not really garden related, because we do have two new chicken owners here and we were on the topics of chickens and cold. One thing I want to point out is, is for both of them is make sure that during the colder months where you live, now you're not going to have it as cold as Rich and I do, but during those colder months, don't button everything down to where you think it's going to be nice and toasty, warm in there, because the chickens, as they breathe, they're going to have that moisture, and the moisture in the cold will then possibly give them frostbite, depending on how cold they get. They have to have some ventilation. The second thing is, is when, when you have those cold months, make sure you have a proper roost for them. They like to go up high to roost. If you have a wide board, then they might not be able to cover their feet properly. They need to have something they can wrap their feet around, and then they sit on it, and they keep their feet warm. And that way you don't have to worry about their feet getting too cold either. Um, somebody else had something to say. Monica, Monica. Yes, I beat Casey to it. He was one to talk too. Wah, okay. Wah, wah. <laughs> so no, I wanted to say, so we everybody talked about when they cleaned out their chicken coops, and I didn't get a chance to speak, but I wanted to say really quickly that we actually have to clean ours out about once a month because we have a smaller coop, and I have a lot of girls. Now, all of my chickens and um, all my chickens go in one coop and all my ducks go in another. And we clean their coop out at least once a month during the winter. If we can try to do the deep bedding, we will sometimes. But if it's been a very wet winter for us, um, we will actually scrape and clean it out because it's a smaller coop. Our girls are only in the coop for safety at night. They free range all the time, all day long all the way until dark, dark, and they put themselves away. And then we close that door up. We have ventilation and stuff, but we only put them in there at night. So they're not even in there for, I mean, maybe they're not even in there for 12 hours, 10 hours, maybe. So everybody's kind of piling in there. We've got everybody kind of going where they're going, but um, we do notice that we will have a smell and it will get damp in there if we do not clean it out during the winter. Um, and we try to be mindful of that. We have the kids very mindful of, okay, mom, the, the chicken coop's really, you can see it's damp. You can smell. It's a damp smell. And if I put my face at the door of my chicken coop and I smell it, I'm like, this is getting cleaned out this weekend. Because I know if it's if it's something that I'm smelling, then they're breathing that in all night long. Um, I've never lost a chicken because of it, but it always scares me because that dampness will breed sickness is what I always think. Dampness is going to be sickness. And I don't ever want that to happen with my girls. So. All right, have at it, whoever wants to talk next. I was about to say, I, no, I was going to jump in before Alicia because, as Monica said, I didn't get to say about the cleaning. Now, again, newbie chicken owner, newbie chicken owner, alert, alert. Um, I heard about cleaning once a month. Now, for those that know me over at Ormsby Farm, know that I have a relatively large chicken coop for the amount of chickens and turkeys that I have. I have about a 55 foot by 35 foot uh, chicken coop. Are you enjoying the hay bale topics? To learn more, click on our Linktree link to get all our product recommendations along with discount codes and more. And there's three sections and then there's a middle space. We call it um, the foyer. Um, in the middle, um, and we tell our chickens when you're waiting for cocktail hour, go wait in the foyer before you have to go to your rooms. Um, but I once a month scrape out the bottom, yeah, pinky up. Um, I scrape out the bedding into the foyer area and let it sit there through the winter. Now I've only had them for 19 weeks. I don't think I've been doing this forever. Um, but I scrape it to the middle and spread it out. But I heard, and I want the experienced chicken owners to chime in. I've heard from other people that I've been in the farmer's market with around town say that I should put plastic around the chicken coop during the winter. Oh, I'm seeing faces. Maybe I should take back that question, Andale. It's a great, it's a great question. Back. Casey, it's a great question. We get okay, that good. all the time. And Alicia... Alicia nailed it. Um, people want to wrap their their coop and their run so tight. 
part of it is people care about their animals. They really do. And they think of them all sometimes as pets, uh, part of the family, that kind of thing. And for us, you know what? A chicken's a chicken. It's part of the part of the farm family, but it's not one of my one of my it's not part of my family. It's not a pet. People want to take care and keep their chickens warm, but they sometimes do things that are counterproductive. They are wrapping their run so tight that there's no airflow and you need airflow. Otherwise, that moisture builds up. And like Monica said, the moisture can lead to, you know, an imbalance in the, uh, uh, you know, too much nitrogen is what it comes down to, too much droppings. And then you get that ammonia smell. Well, that ammonia smell is just the, you know, something dangerous for your chickens. But you And that moisture that Alicia alluded to up in our area, if we get high moisture and it's 15 below, well, all of a sudden their combs are frostbit. Uh, you folks down south probably won't have that. Um, but you, you've got to, we actually, our barn, we've got a like a 10 foot high by 20 foot door that I open every day, unless it is snowing in, in the middle of winter, if it's 20 below, I'm opening that door where there is total airflow in that barn. Um, it ventilates out the top as well. I don't want that moisture to build up. And if you've got a smell, you've got too much nitrogen, too much droppings, throw some straw in there, get that mixed in there. Okay. Once you get that balance between the nitrogen and the carbon, there is no smell. It's when you get that smell or ammonia, there's too much nitrogen, too much dropping in there. Scoop it out, and then you got to have this balance going. Uh, and okay. Miss Ann, you can put lemon balm in there. You can put some marigolds in there. There's things that you can put in your cube that the chickens will love, and it will kind of, the lemon balm will help with the smell too, and, and they love having it in there. The, okay. The one thing that doesn't, that, it's like having a, a deodorizer in your in your house. That doesn't get rid of the problem that there's too much nitrogen. It just kind of masks, you know, and it smells like marigolds and all that. But if you start smelling that, you want to make sure that you throw some carbon in there or get rid okay. of that nitrogen. Um, and by carbon, you mean bedding. Car carbon is the bedding. Yep, the straw. Um, it could be the, the wood shavings that Alicia uses, uh, any of that stuff, anything brown. It could be, you know, I brought in a, a big bag of leaves in the winter. Uh, brown okay, leaves. That's and put what them. I was curious. Can you use leaves? Because sure. we have a lot of leaves. Yep. Yep. Make sure they're brown and they're dry and all right. that. Uh, you know, you don't want wet because then, uh, you know, you get into Monica's problem where there's a moisture buildup because then then if it gets cold, then you got moisture in the air and then you got chance of frostbite on on legs and feet and stuff. So. Um, OK. All right. It's all a balance. It is. <laughs> Who knew chickens? And, you know, so who knew hard. that we would get so sidetracked talking about chickens when all we were talking about was Rich prepares his garden for the next year by uprooting the dead plants, creating a hole, putting some some soil in there with his chicken manure that's composted, and then we went off sidetrack. I know Monica, you wanted to say something. So I was going to actually ask about that. So I was going to redirect us back to the compost topic. So we we're talking about composting and getting things ready for your um, next, for, you know, garden, kind of wrapping up garden season. When you do your compost, so here's a question that I feel like is controversial. Do you take your old plants that you're pulling out of your garden and do you throw those plants in your compost? Because I've heard that you don't want to put those plants in your compost because you could possibly add disease. Like if plants have disease, you're adding that to your compost. And I'm just going to be the first one to say it. I don't care if it's dead and it's in my garden and the animals don't eat it. Like if it's, if it's in my garden and we're pulling it out, we give it the, give it to the pigs and chickens and ducks and cows. Or if not, we throw it right in the compost. I mean, it's not that we don't care. We definitely it's care. It's long but, hair, don't care kind of thing. Yeah, it's one of those things, but we're just, we don't, we, it's, I don't discriminate, okay? If my cows will eat it or my pigs will eat it, it's going to the animals first. And if it's something that they're not going to eat, then we just throw it in the, in the wheelbarrow and throw it in the four wheeler and the kids take it to compost because I'm not just going to let it, I'm not going to what burn it. I don't know. There's just, it's, I guess for me, it's too much work to burn it and be scared of something. We just throw it in the compost. So what do you guys do? Do you throw it in the compost? I, I make two piles, um, uh, maybe a third here. I do not compost tomatoes, any leftover tomato stalks and all that. I've, 
I've heard that. So I do remove that. Apart from that, anything, you know, I've got all my eggplant that I pulled out last night and some of the peppers that are really thick stalked that just don't ever want to break down. I make a pile of those. They dry for about a month. Somewhere in November, I'm going to get the torch out. We're going to have a fire. I'm going to burn all that stuff down into a little pile of ash. All the other, the peas and the beans and stuff, they Do go in the compost. we have pyro grandpa now? So we have pyro grandma and now pyro grandpa in the... In the fun. <laughs> it's fun. Fire fun. Sorry, no, Rich. Go. I love a good fire. No, I, all that other, the beans and peas and smaller stock stuff, they go into a pile with the dirt and the chicken manure, and I just mix that up. The other stuff I burn down at, in November, and I throw that ash in with the pile and kind of... It okay. all works together. Otherwise, those stalks like eggplant, I mean, it'd be several years from now and it's still not going to break down. So That's otherwise, right. yeah. tomatoes are the only thing that I've heard that can really carry disease yeah. from year to year. Maybe I'm way off on that. but We have such a big pile of manure out there. And I mean, our compost bin is massive. I mean, Eric puts his tractor into our compost bin. To like dig it in, you know, tractor buckets full the way he built it. So even if, I mean, anything we throw in there, it's always composted completely down by the time we're ready to use our garden again. So it's not, plus, I mean, my animals will eat tomato plants. So whatever we don't put in, but it was always one of those things I was interested in wondering if people do. So yeah, I don't, know. I don't compost my tomatoes either. I was about to say, I don't compost the tomatoes, but I heard, and I actually heard from Sandy over at Suburban Homesteader, Wyoming, Arizona, um, that when you leave your plants, the dead plants, tomato plants, pepper plants, eggplant, whatever, leave it in your garden and let them be dead in your plants or in your garden for like a month or so. Because all the nutrition that it has soaked up over the years, it will release back into your soil. So what I do is when my tomato plants die, I let them stay there dead, dead, and they they looking dead, dead in my garden right now. Um, in my garden until probably end of November, early December here in the South. Now it's different for Rich and for Alicia, but December, January is when I start pulling all of the stuff up because they've had enough time now to die, die, release all of the nutrition back into my soil, and that's when I pull it up now. Rich had said before, and I wanted to comment, but we got sidetracked. I am actually the crazy person that pulls up my ground cover every single garden year, rolls it up all nice and neat, and labels it so that I can retail. Now, that's because I do an in-ground garden. If you go see Rich, Rich has the raised beds, the troughs. I have an in-ground garden, even with well, mine. mine. Mine are in-ground too, though, Casey. Oh, oh. Yeah, well, I put the soil, the the garden fabric down, and then I burn holes every 18 inches. So the, there's holes there, and then I, I make sure every year that I dig that out. And so put basically some new I'm psycho, y'all, because I was going to say, well, yeah, because I'm, not, I... well, no, because I'm in ground, I pull mine up. I still pull mine up because I'm just crazy like that. You and like to do a lot of extra work. I do. I like to do extra work. And um, uh, I do because I feel that people are going to drive by and be like, oh, my gosh, that's that Casey's house over there. You know, the one that leaves all the ground cover in over the winter. <laughs> so that's why I roll it up. Huh? Um, because I, I like to um, calzyme the crap out of my garden. I'll go and put fertilizer in and I'll till it for the year. But I do that after that I've pulled my tip my dead dead plants up so bringing it back around that is when i pull it up is after i pull up my plants alicia well i wanted to say that last winter i chose to take a different approach to winterizing my garden to prepare for spring and i left everything in the garden because i wanted all of the pollinators that had laid their eggs or were hibernating over winter i wanted them to you know to have their winter where they laid their eggs and they were going to come out in the spring. For me, I learned that first year to do that. That was a terrible mistake because it was so difficult then in spring to try to pull out all those sticky things that were poking me in the ear and poking me in the eye and scratching me when I'm trying to pull it all up. But then even beyond that, all of the robins had built their nests in there 
and I didn't want to disturb the nests and the eggs and the babies. So I just had to leave the dead garden in, in, so I, so that life could go on for the birds. <laughs> so the birds and the bees won out last year for my garden. So that's, I won't that's be your doing new that sponsor. again. <laughs> um, birds and the bees. Yeah. The, the uh, Casey, the one thing I, I don't want to till every year and fertilize all the garden i've got my rows are three feet apart if i pull up the fabric and i'm fertilizing the whole thing you know what i'm fertilizing three feet that i'm not even using my plants are you know here and here why do i want fertilizer in between i know my roots usually go out about a foot square and down I, that's where i want to focus my energy and for the energy of the plant instead of the the area in the fabric where i'm walking so just an idea for you you know, focus your fertilizer where it needs to be. Um, now, are you, are, do you do, because I know that Monica had mentioned this. For those that listen, we have kind of like a, um, a host chat that nobody else can see. But I am really crazy. And like one year I put all the plants in a certain area and then I'm like, oh, I don't like how that looks. So I rotate everything around, which is what I'm doing next year. Because I'm like, oh, that looked really stupid where I had it this year and it doesn't look as pretty. I can't post on Instagram. Um so I move stuff. So I'll say that, Rich. I do pull mine up also because I'm indecisive and I can't decide where I want to put plants every year. And I've already burnt the holes because for those who listened, I actually watched Rich's video and took his advice and got this butane torch that um, Monica said I was a brown noser for mentioning. But I did. I burned the holes in and I loved it. It is the best thing yep. ever. Anyways. I can't, do you actually switch your crops around or are they, they yep. in the same spot every single year? There, there's certain, I mean, I've got what we call tomato alley, that big, uh, it's 40 feet long, the big hoop uh, hoop garden or hoop trellis of uh, uh, those cattle panels. That's where I put the tomatoes every year. They They kind of fit in there, but I do dig out the soil and put new soil in case there's something that the tomatoes might leave from year to year. Um, otherwise, my rows uh, in the raised, not well, the raised beds I rotate absolutely. Where I had potatoes last year that could maybe leave something for uh, the potatoes this year, I put carrots in. We rotate the onions, the carrots, all the the root crops, all that gets rotated. In the the garden fabric area, I rotate that as well. Where peppers are this year, I might put eggplant next year. Um, all that stuff, peppers, eggplant, uh, broccoli, um, cabbage, all that stuff can be 18 inches apart. So once I've got those holes in there, there it's multifunctional for, for different plants. Um, and now I've got two sides of the garden that are garden fabric, so I can rotate end to end as well. So you did your work up front. It pays off in the long run. You're going to have things are going to be so much easier every time around now. Yep. And I don't have to do anything other than if, dig and plant right. next spring from year and to year. If, if you get the chance to go check out Rich's videos, like I said, you've got to see the really unique way that he does his melons and his squash. I showed uh, one of his videos to my dear friend who lives in Tennessee this year. I said, you've got to see how he does this because I love this, the little circular thing that you do. You, you have these big areas with a stake in the center, and then he just plants everything in a circle around that stake, 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 and it grows out, and he has all the room he needs, and it's everything is designated where it needs to be. And at first, she was like, I don't understand what he's doing. I don't know why he's doing it. I said, it's genius do that and you know she's doing it this year Good. she saw the value in it as it came in she's like okay now i get what he's doing and i like what he's doing and me i'm sitting here going okay now i need to till up that big huge plot over here because i want to do it next year but <laughs> that's what I'm, I'm i'm grabbing all the chicken manure right now and putting them on those mounds so I, i've already i'm starting to establish my mounds for next year and the, that those mounds, the stake in the middle only tells me once everything started to grow, those vining crops, you can't tell where you planted them after a while. They're just here, there, and everywhere. Well, I, 
then I know where to aim the hose to water those things. It's like, okay, that stake is right in the middle of the mound. If I water right around there in a three foot area, I've got it. Um, trying to think of what, oh, you, um, you know, I, boy, I had some notes. I was going to talk about a bunch of things. One, I'll, I'll just we give a, a one back. minute. We, we, we need to have you back because you have so much knowledge. There's no way we can get all the knowledge in one hour, obviously, because we right. a, get sidetracked. But B, you yep. really do have a great setup that we could all learn from and we want to learn more. But what were you going to say about your your notes that you've got there? No, I just uh, I mean, I at the end of the year, what are you doing for next year? I'm evaluating what worked, what didn't work. If it didn't work, why didn't it work? Look through your garden notes that hopefully you've been making all summer. About, and what did work? Okay, do I want to do it again? What didn't work and then why? So you can either fix it or decide not to do that the next year. I'm looking at infrastructure. What more is needed for next year? Can I actually do it? Do I, will I have the time to do it? And then what's the cost? I'm big on saving for something and doing it right versus going out and finding four pallets and trying to make it work and then it's a disaster. So can you save for it? Um, this is the time of year where pull everything you can out of the garden and for your food prep and your, your preservation, get it done. Don't leave anything in the garden if you can. And if you don't have a use for it, get it to someone who can use it. Food shelf, neighbors, relatives, whatever, get it out of there. Um, and then start looking at your plants for next year, you know, get your seed orders, uh, be thinking about that. And I put down just for animals. You know, prepare, we're preparing for winter. Make sure we've got security so no animals can get in and, and harm our, our animals. Um, make sure they can stay out of the elements. Us folks up north, do we have our water heaters? Do they work? You know, test those things before it's 10 below and you go out and your water's all frozen. So some of those things. I just I had a bunch of, there's a lot of things, but what the main thing, what worked, what didn't work, and why? And then try to build for next year. You know, you mentioned the word preparing what you pull out of the garden. You have something really unique. I believe that there are several channels that participate. Why don't you share with everybody about what you do when you pull everything out of your garden and you're getting it into the pantry? You have something special called $50 February. Why don't you let 50. everybody know what that's about? Yeah, we've done it for a couple of years, and, and I'm not going to claim I, I'm, I'm a good promoter, but I didn't come up with it. Uh, the folks up in uh, Alberta, uh, Annette, um, oh, geez. What's Annette's channel? Annette and Glenn. The Cow Emporium. Cow Emporium. I went, yep. I went blank. Thank you. Uh, Annette and Glenn up at the Cow Emporium came up with the idea and they were trying to, you know, only do so much per week, you know, like $12 per week for food in, in February. I said, well, that's so hard. Why don't we just make it $50 February? It kind of rings better. So the object is to only for a family of two, only spend $50 for February for food. The rest of it you've spent, you know, we're preparing for February 24. We've spent this whole season hopefully getting ready for that, putting away vegetables. Um, maybe we've been out fishing, uh, any animals that we've raised and, uh, and put away for uh, next year. So any of that food that you can prep and be ready for next year, the object is to only spend $50. And it's a heck of a challenge. We did it last year. And we, we made it, um, we did some other prepping, but part of what we did was we traded vegetables for uh, half of a pig. We traded for other, uh, other meats and such. Um, this year, um, well, let me back up just a second. If you don't think you can hit $50 for a family of two, then make it a different challenge. What, how little can you spend? How much can you prepare to rate to the object is for preparation having better food you know it's just a good challenge uh for midwinter if you can't do 50 dollars and you can't put it away see what you can how little you can do this year and then next year prepare for the following february and try to go even lower i've got a real challenge in that my garden was just decimated with a storm we had hail that literally ruined almost probably 90% of our garden. So for $50 February, I thought, okay, we're done. We, we can't even start it. Well, you know what we did two years ago, we really had a good bounty and we canned 
everything we could. And we have still got stuff from two years ago. Mm -hmm. We have still got um, meat that we didn't use last year. We've, you know, we were able to get some meat. We went fishing. We were able to trade for some chickens, that kind of thing. I think we're going to do okay. We're not going to do great. We're going to do okay. But it showed that if you think you've got enough stuff set aside, put some more aside because you never oh. know. We worked all spring and summer, and in 20 minutes, our garden was gone. Right. Had we not prepped the year before, and I'm not a prepper or prepper. We're just trying to cover our own food. Had I not That's done right. that or we not done that two years ago, we'd be really up a creek. So. I think we're going to be okay. Um, there, we've got a video on, on our channel. There's several channels that are participating. If people, whether they've got a channel or whether they're just Joe Homesteader, come join us. It's a great challenge to see how much food you can put away for you to to get ready. Monica, you... Well, I think it's important too to note, like one of the things that I, I really wanted to do this last year and I started to do it and I started, I was really excited and Eric and I talk about it all the time because I was really excited for this challenge. But for me, it was really hard to grow as much food as our family eats. I, I just can't. Oh, my garden isn't big enough. We're a large family. Um, we also provide meat and vegetables for my extended family. And so whenever I can, I mean, I put everything away I possibly can. But one of the things I really started doing was because of your challenge, it really encouraged me to look at what I had in my food stores. You know, do we, we do, we drink a lot of like milk and almond milk and things like that. So I wanted to make sure I had almond milk put away. So I actually mm -hmm. bought extra. So when I started going to like Costco and things like that, I would buy an extra box every other like shopping trip. I would buy an extra something. I would spend an extra like $30 on just and $30 seems like a lot for other people, but for us, $30 is like a drop in the bucket right now when it comes to my food preps. But I would spend a little bit of extra money on proper items that I would be able to put in my stores. And I'm just going to say that right now we're still using milk, like almond milk in boxes um, from the summer that I put away in the beginning of this past summer because it was became a habit for me to be able to do that. And so I told the kids, I was like, look, they're going to expire by the end of, you know, by the beginning of next year, I want to start using these stores. But we got into the habit that when my kids saw something come out of our, you know, large pantry closet or wherever, they immediately thought, mom, we're only down to two bottles of ketchup. I just want to let you know, they would know if we got down to one, they would write ketchup on there or they would write whatever we were missing. And so they got into a habit of knowing that if we got low, they need to replenish. And that for me was a huge game changer for our family because if there's a situation where we lose a job, we have something going on where there's an emergency, we can't get to the, we can't get to the grocery, we can't get to here or there. We have enough to get us through. It's not just about ketchup. It's about milk and about vegetables. And it's about things like that. We have you've meat changed, away. The, you've changed the whole mindset of your family, though. I did. Thinking and about that. that. That was awesome for me because my kids know now. I'm like, tonight, my kids were like, Mom, do we have any honey mustard? And I'm like, Well, I don't know. Go look in our large pantry. Go look. And we call it the apocalypse pantry. That's what the kids have named it now. <laughs> and they say, I said, Well, go look in the apocalypse pantry. And then the ones, my one son came out, the 15 year old, he was like, We have no honey mustard. I said, We'll either make some fresh or write it on the list and I'll grab it next time. But that's your responsibility to make sure you're telling me what we've run out of. So we have, we've really changed our mindset. So we may not have been able to participate necessarily in the $50 February because I do actually have three birthdays in February, but we did it in a different way. So you and uh, Annette have changed our view of how we keep our family prepared. So that right there yes. was huge for me. So thank you for doing that because it encouraged me to Absolutely. look at things differently. So No, yeah, I was going to kind of piggyback on that too because um, we – at Ormsby Farm did kind of join in. I made the video and then I kind of went dark um, for a while on YouTube. We'll just call it that. But you, this whole challenge changes your mindset. It truly stops you and says, hey, okay, you, sh you probably could do this if you sit and think, okay, now how can I make this work? How can I make $50 stretch from all the work that I do from April to September, again, that's for me and Dale and Monica here in the South. That's our growing season. If I'm growing stuff all these months, I'm putting it away, I'm prepping meat, I'm processing freezer camping meat, 
how can I make this work? And I'm about to sneeze on the radio show. <laughs> Excuse me. It's because I'm so excited about $50 February that it just makes me sneeze every time. But no, you... It changes your mindset. It makes you think of certain things. Like, even though you may really want to go out to that Mexican restaurant, you're like, oh, I should be able to pull it from my pantry. And I should probably do something that I've put away, that I've prepped, that I've made. Um, and I, I I thank you, Annette, for that. for Because yes. it, it changes us homesteaders' mind okay. on how we prep. There's a couple, and there's a couple layers, I should say. Annette and we went for the hardcore, that the $50 was just to get other things you needed. But we tried to grow or raise or harvest in some way all of our food for February. So it was totally self-sufficient. It was not go to your pantry and get it. There are other people who, like Monica's version, Fill your pantry and prepare for February as if it would be a job loss, a big storm, uh, something were to happen where you could use the pantry. So there's several layers to do it. The object is not to go to the store January 31st, fill up your pantry, and then not buy groceries in February. The idea is to prepare for it. um, And the the big, big object would be how much could you put away from your garden, from your animals, from this and that. Um, and the $50, I mean, the hardest thing for me was giving up my darn Pepsi, you know, and some people it's given up some of those other luxury things. I do have a daughter who has a February birthday. I will say that I did not count that in my thing. I, I did cheat one day. I am not going to make her eat, you know, a chicken because we got it and some broccoli out of the garden. We went out for food. So and you Rich, you just need, Rich, you just got to get a soda stream. And, you know, around the hay bale, we have an affiliate link for that because Pepsi is actually one of the sponsors for soda stream. And you could have your soda stream syrup for Pepsi all year for under all $50. February, especially. Well, I try to go, I try to go hardcore. I, if I didn't raise it, I can't put that, that soda stream there. No, I oh, got that, to raise true. it. That's but true. You know, Rich You're brings sounding up a good like point. Monica's kids now. <laughs> <laughs> he brings up a good point because many of our listeners, they're not quite to that stage or maybe they, they don't strive for the stage where they're going to grow everything on their own. For me, I heard about the, the, the challenge and I'm a vegetarian. All of you know, I'm a vegetarian. So I do have some some fakey meats that I use in some of my dishes, and there are other things that I use. I actually participated in fifty dollar February in my own way, and so it was really nice for for Rich and Annette to put this up because it made me think about what I was doing. I made sure instead of like you guys said, instead of going out for that Mexican meal, or instead of saying I'm bored today, I'm going to go buy this at the store. I made use of what I had in my pantry. It really made me look at what I have in there. Now, a lot of it is from my garden. I have, you know, my, my eggs that I make into certain things and put them in the freezer. I had those I could pull from, but you know, I'm proud to say that even though a lot of it did come from the garden and the store, I only spent $5 for the whole month of February because I forced myself to use what I had in the pantry. However, I did want to make sure that I didn't go crazy because that is my survival surplus because Rich knows as much as I do where we live. If we get a good blizzard come through, we're not, there's times we're not getting off the farm for several days. Now, I don't know about, I, like I said, I've been to Rich's farm. I don't know how often the snow plow comes by where he lives, but there's times where we live, they don't come for eight days. So I want to make sure I don't deplete myself. I don't want to go on like, oh, wow, I've got 12 boxes of macaroni and cheese. I think I'm just going to deplete all the macaroni and cheese and have a heyday in, in February and eat all the macaroni and cheese. I only, I only prepared what I needed very frugally. I was frugal during February because it did make me have that mindset of what if there is no store to go to? And these are my reserves. And this is what I need to pull from. And I'm going to be frugal about it. And I only spent the $5 on some French vanilla creamer. Because in my stores, I do have five-gallon buckets with the French press, the coffee grinder, and the coffee. But Mama has to have 
the creamer to go with it. Yeah. Casey? Uh, well, wrapping this episode up, because again, we had so much fun with Rich tonight. We could just chat for three, four hours. But on this $50 February challenge, I want to, on on our episode, on this podcast, live and in color, challenge all of my co-hosts, Monica from Bland's Promised Land Ranch, Anne from Andell Homestead, Alicia from Country Mama Musing, myself at Ormsby Farm, and of course, Rich at Old Sweets Farm, to join in on this $50 February this year and give it a good old solid hee-ho. And for our listeners, um, if you want to head over to our Instagram page in February, the Round the Hay Bale Instagram page, make sure to give us a like. We will post daily between the four channels. We will give kind of an update if all of us are kind of down to try. Um, co-hosts, are we down to try? I know Ormsby Farm, we're in it for the win it. How about you, Monica? Sure. I will do my best. <laughs> and my best. That's all you can do is do your very best. Yeah, I'm in there for the college try. Alicia. I don't mind, but I do have one question. What is that Rich, question? Do I have to include? Do I have to include my husband's lunches at work? Well, usually it's all the food. All you know. the food. But you know what? Uh, be creative. Um, uh, uh, don't it, give her any it, out, Rich. Just tell her yes. Tell her yes, Rich. It, it is all the. It is I all mean, the food. It is all the food. I don't, for I the don't mind accepting the challenge for me and pulling what I need to from my family here at the farm. But poor Papa Jim, he's a hardworking man. I want to make sure he's got something in his fridge at work. Well, I, just, you know, I want to make sure Casey. that just blame you it on Casey, sure that, uh, Holly can eat at work too. So you know, you, I think we'll we'll be in the same boat. Come get we some. We all want to eat. Come get some beef from Bland's Promised Land Ranch, Alicia. I'll make sure Papa Jim has some meat up there for his lunches. Oh, Monica, that reminds me of a story, but I can't share it here. I'll have to share it with you later. It, it can be a team effort, gang. This is where, you know, get we got to know a beef, a beef person, and we traded eggs and veggies for beef. We traded it for pork. Find those partnerships in your area. Someone might be making cheese, and they don't have chickens. They, you know, find those partnerships because that – it takes a community here sometimes to, to make this work. Um, we've made some invaluable connections. Um, just Casey, with your with everybody checking into your Instagram, there's a hashtag out there, hashtag 50, not the word, but at 50, hashtag $50 February 2024. If you put that in YouTube, if you put it in Instagram, there's a lot of people that are doing it and everybody's saving notes. So Put, put that in Instagram so everybody's kind of tying it together. Hashtag Absolutely. $50 Absolutely. 2024. That sounds good. Well, I'll participate, but we just have to make sure that poor Papa Jim doesn't starve in the meantime. He's a hardworking man. All right, guys. Well, you know, we want to thank Rich so much for spending the time with us. We went over on our recording time just because, like we said, there is so much to cover and he has so much knowledge to share and we appreciate him showing up here and spending this time with us. And we hope that, you know, maybe in the future he'll come back for another future episode. Hopefully we don't run him off and scare him too much because we've really enjoyed our time with him here. So thank you so much, Rich. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks. I'll come back anytime. Awesome. Glad to hear it. Well, friends out there in radio land and podcast land, we'd like to thank you so much for joining us here for this podcast. Don't forget that all of our podcasts drop on all of the social media platforms for podcasting on Monday mornings at nine o'clock central. Then you can join us on our Round the Hay Bale channel on YouTube and also Beginning Homesteaders Guide on Facebook for our radio show where we come back on Tuesday mornings and we talk about the podcast that drops on Monday mornings. So you get two, two, two for the price of one. So we hope you'll join us for those. We also want to thank Kyle Kelly. He is the wonderful guy who puts all of our music promos together and we'd like to thank him for doing such a great job. As we always say when we close out our show, we like to thank you so much for being here with us and spending time with us. You mean a lot to us, and we appreciate you being here. Make sure you take care of yourself, take care of each other, and have a blessed week. And we'll see you next time here, Round the Hay Bale.
Join your hosts back here next week on Round the Hay Bale.